Come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'll be reviewing and paging through Lamentations of the Flame Princess, Rules and Magic, written by James Edward Raji IV. Is this early OSR release still one of the best? Or does Lamentations of the Flame Princess focus far too much on being shocking for the sake of being shocking? Well, you're going to find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open, I am going to be reviewing Lamentations of the Flame Princess Rules and Magic in just a moment. But before I do, did want to once again thank everybody out there who have sent all the kind thoughts and prayers regarding my recent triple bypass surgery. It has been a month since the surgery, and my doctors are telling me that uh, I am well ahead of the curve, that I am doing extremely well. And uh, except my voice is still kind of raspy. My voice isn't back to normal. And I guess it's going to be a few months possibly before it does return to normal. But everything else, feeling great. And once again, I appreciate all of you out there who sent your kind thoughts and prayers my way. It is certainly appreciated. All right, that said, today I am going to be reviewing and paging through Lamentations of the Flame Princess, Rules and Magic, which is written by James Edward Raji IV. Artwork is provided by Rowena Aitken, Aaron Elfrey, Ernie Chen, Dean Clayton, Vincent Locke, Eric Lofgren, Rich Longmore, Russ Nicholson, Jason Rainville, Cynthia Shepard, and Amos Orion Stearns. The 167-page hardcover is available for an MSRP of $20. You can get the PDF over at DriveThruRPG for $5, or you can also score the Art Free Edition absolutely free. So I also do want to mention that the Gaming Gang is an affiliate of the One Bookshelf sites. So if you are going to visit DriveThruRPG, for an example, please stop by the GamingGang.com first, Click on one of our banner ads, and that way, if you happen to make a purchase, I get a little portion of that sale. And all those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do help keep the gaming gang around. All right, let's swing on over to the other camera, because here I've got Lamentations of the Flame Princess, Rules and Magic. So I had asked some folks what OSR role-playing game they wanted to see me do a review of. And Lamentations of the Flame Princess was a very, very popular title that people were saying, hey, Jeff, I'd love to, to get your feedback, find out what you think of this pretty classic OSR release. So I do want to mention, I purchased this book. This was not a review copy sent to me. So, of course, that obviously means that no one associated with Lamentations of the Flame Princess has offered any sort of compensation for me to share my thoughts about this book. And that is always the case with the gaming gang. We do not accept any sort of compensation for us to say anything about gaming products. So, I purchased this. I picked this up on Amazon, and uh, I got it for $20. So this is actually the first of two books because there is a referees book as well. I am going to look into picking that up. I haven't heard a whole lot about it, though. Usually I hear about the core book right here, The Rules and Magic. So let's take a look at the back. I'm not going to read everything from the back of the book here, but beyond the veil of reality, beyond the influence of manipulating politicians, greedy merchants, Iron-handed clergy and the broken masses that toil for their benefit. Echoes of other realms call to those bold enough and desperate enough to escape the oppression of mundane life. Treasure and glory await those courageous enough to wrest it from the darkness. But the danger is great. 
for lurking in the forgotten shadows are forces far stranger and more perilous than even civilization. The price of freedom must be paid in souls. All right, let's jump on in. So I do want to point out that a lot of people uh, have the impression that Lamentations of the Flame Princess is very graphic. There's a lot of nudity and things like that. Now, I got to be honest. This is the only book I've seen. So as far as adventures go and other supplemental material goes, I can't tell you. Yes, there is some graphic violence in the images. Yes, there's some nudity. Not anything that I was like, oh my God, I am so completely shocked. There's one image in here, and, and you're not going to see any of these in this video, but there is one image in here. It's a black and white image that's kind of a gross out image, but the whole kind of uh, vibe where this game is just all about shock value and there really isn't a lot of OSR role-playing goodness to this is not true. It is not true at all, essentially, in this core book. As far as the, the setting itself, there's just hints at it, mainly in the magic section of the book. But uh, the setting, supposedly, if I understand correctly, is, is kind of like a, a pseudo-historical, like 16th century Europe. But you have monsters and creatures and things like that as well. It's really not covered in this book. This, this book is very concise. It is all about the rules of the game, as well as a good section of magic spells, which I really like. And we're going to talk about utilizing this book with other role-playing games that might be your system of choice. So as far as character creation, very common for the OSR movement. We've got our 3D6. We're going to roll for our Charisma, Constitution, Dexterity, Intelligence, Strength, and Wisdom. So also do want to point out that I'm going to stay picture in picture up here in the corner. So I am going to be cutting off a section of the book here. I usually do that and skip pages on that to prevent people from pirating books from the videos, which I know, amazingly enough, people do try to do that. This has been out for quite some time. I'm not really that concerned with it. I just figured I'll stay picture in picture because I always do. So essentially, you're going to roll your 3D6. And depending on the score, you might get some modifiers, some penalties, some bonuses. After you've done that, if uh, your uh, ability modifiers are less than zero. If they're negatives, you can actually toss that character out and re-roll a new one. So we've got character classes. There are four classes as well as three races included. So yes, this is a throwback to old school D&D &D where race is class. We have three different alignments. We've got lawful, neutral, as well as chaotic. And uh, we have starting possession. So you're buying equipment, choosing your name, and you're good to go. Reality is you can roll up a character and be ready to play. I got to be honest, in, in five minutes, once you know what you're doing. So we've got the cleric. So, of course, the, the cleric is a kind of religious warrior. Uh, and they have spells. And, of course, at first level, they actually get a spell. So this section here, we got the level, the experience points that are needed to reach that level, the hit points as far as what D, what die are used. So this is a D6. Got our saving throws, and then it talks about number of spells per level. One thing I will mention as far as gaining spells on uh, leveling up, they have to be researched. They don't just magically appear. So that is one of the aspects of magic in this game. And I, I like that. I appreciate that. It shouldn't... Maybe not so much cleric spells, like maybe the deity decides they're going to open up, you know, more knowledge to their devotee. But as far as magic users, I think, I think that that plays out pretty well. We've got the fighter and the fighter. Each of these characters have a little something going on as far as what sets them apart. Of course, the fighter gets, uh, gets to utilize some martial skills that other character classes do not, they also receive 
a bonus to their D20 upon each level. So nobody else outside the fighter gets that ability. We also got the magic user. And then we've got the specialist. And the specialist is kind of our thief rogue. And interestingly enough, we've got these different skills that all the characters essentially have. And it's on a D6. It's one in six chance of succeeding. And the specialist gets so many points they can actually put into these skills. So at first level, they'll actually get four points that they can add into the skills. We've got architecture, bushcraft, climb, languages, search, sleight of hand, sneak attack, stealth, and tinker. I like a lot of the artwork throughout the book. Some pretty cool looking artwork. I like the uh, this kind of almost like a woodcut kind of style of art. We see quite a few uh, images throughout the book that have this style, which I, I do like for an example right there for the dwarf. So we do have races class. We've got the dwarf, the elf, as well as the halfling. And of course, each of these will have their own special abilities as well. We get in some equipment, which we have the equipment lists up front. And then the, the back we actually have almost uh, what you would find on a Game Master screen. we got the rules of the game. And one thing you'll notice throughout is everything is just real concise. There's just a few paragraphs. It explains things perfectly. It's not overstaying its welcome by droning on for page after page after page. I definitely like that quite a lot. Talking about experience points, though, one thing I disagree with as far as how you will gain experience points for your player characters is that you can, you earn it from treasure, which is fine. That's, that's completely old school. You gain experience from defeating monsters. Yeah. Some OSR games, it's like that. Others are not, but the one way you do not get experience points is by defeating opponents through non-combat resolution. I think that's weird, really weird. Personally, I would, I would not stick with that. I would give my player characters experience for successfully negotiating through a situation, be it if they had to kill the, the monsters or, or kill the baddies or the minions or the brigands or what have you or if they found an interesting way to get through that, as opposed to like running away and, and, you know, kind of circumventing that encounter that I wouldn't give experience for that then. So we get some rules about foraging and hunting hazards, healing languages, movement and encumbrance. The movement and encumbrance rules are very interesting. They're very easy to understand. And I know there are a lot of people I have heard who actually have stolen the encumbrance rules and utilize them in their own games as well. Maybe they're not using Lamentations of the Flame Princess as their core rule set, but they are using the encumbrance rules. One thing I do want to point out that I thought was kind of uh, unusual was we really don't see a negative modifier because of encumbrance. I thought that was, that was a little different. So we have personal encumbrance. We also have mounts as well. So because this is old school Renaissance, you're looking at, you know, having hirelings and minions and men at arms, and you're probably going to have different, uh, different mules and pack animals to carry all your gear and hopefully your treasure. So we get into some of those skills like sleight of hand and stealth, tinkering. And those are the one and six. And then we get a, uh, a section, a little section here about maritime adventures, which I thought was very cool. We don't usually see that in a core rule book. It's usually something that's tacked on later on. So here we get into retainers. These are the hirelings and so forth, property and finance. Then we get into encounters. So we start talking about combat. 
And Lamentations of the Flame Princess is an ascending armor class game. Resolution is on a D20, except for those skills where you're rolling a D6. And of course, in combat, you're looking at essentially rolling equal to or higher than the armor class of your opponent. And then you will do damage based upon the weapon or magic item or whatever you're happening to be using a magic spell, so forth. So we get into uh, some detail about some of the options in combat. One of the odd things that I don't know how it, I don't know how I've missed it. I just don't think it's here is action resolution. And I think this is just going back to the point of where it is the player skill as opposed to character skills. But I find it kind of unusual we don't have any resolution for like dexterity or strength or wisdom or intelligence. Now, those bonuses that we've seen, they are applied to different things, but we don't have anything where it's like roll under the attribute to succeed, anything like that. That I would certainly use as a house rule because that is right pretty much in theme with Lamentations of the Flame Princess. So we get a section here in the center where we get some color artwork. For my understanding, uh, many of these are covers from Adventures for Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Some of it's kind of graphic. Uh, I am going to skip past a couple of images that are in here that some people may take offense to. Once again, it's, it's artwork in a role-playing game. It's not going to freak me out. So now we get into spells, and this is another section that I really, really like about Lamentations of the Flame Princess. And we get some discussion about clerics as well as magic users, creating scrolls, creating potions, creating magic wands. One thing that is not present in this book is a section about magic items. And I'm sure that probably throws a lot of people off. There's also not a bestiary in here either. Uh, which is not super unusual. There are some old school Renaissance role playing games that don't have a bestiary. This is one of them. Uh, I understand I've had some folks comment on the previous video. I did a, a first look page through for Lamentations of the Flame Princess on my live stream, the Gaming Gang Dispatch, and uh, did have a comment uh, on that video telling me that uh, Veins of the Earth is not only an excellent supplement for Lamentations of the Flame Princess, but it is also uh, a really good bestiary as well. It's got a lot of monsters and creatures and so forth. So then we get into the spells, and I, I honestly think that this is a real highlight to this rule set. And this is another thing that I would probably recommend if you aren't going to use this as your core system, that you swipe this. And I talk about it all the time as someone who has run role-playing games for over four decades. In my opinion, good game masters steal from everything. So if there is a setting or system out there that you like something from, plug it in. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. Uh, one of the things that I, I do really like about the the spells in this book is it's not all just the same stuff we've seen over and over and over again. Yes, there are some tried and true detect magic, dispel magic, divination. Sure. But then we've got some other spells that are, are pretty cool and a little bit different. Personally, I think the summoning spell is awesome. It is, I, it's, I, I can almost say it's worth the price of admission alone. And especially if you're picking up the PDF for $5 or the art free PDF, absolutely free. It is a no brainer picking it up just to check out the summoning spell. 
that is in here because uh, there's quite a bit to it. Something else I really do like about the magic spells is that we get a couple of paragraphs. We basically get, okay, here's our information. What is it? Okay, so for an example, plant growth is a level four magic user spell. It's a permanent duration, and it's got a range of uh, 120 feet. And then we get a paragraph telling us what it does. There, there's no spells outside of the summoning spell that goes on for pages and pages. I don't need that much detail. <laughs> I don't. I really don't. That is why I am a big proponent of old school Renaissance role playing games where it's not sitting there and having to memorize just minutia in order to play the game. I like seat of my pants game mastering huge fan of that and uh rules be damned is how i've always looked at it so here we go this is where we're getting in the summon spell very very cool uh one aspect too i should point out even though there isn't the bestiary in here there's some discussion about creatures and monsters and it's essentially telling you hey you know what Concern yourself with what does the monster do? What, what makes this different? As opposed to just, well, let me give you all these stat blocks and things like that. It has uh, a, a similar approach, although not as detailed, as Dungeon Crawl Classics does to their monsters. I, I would say if you're familiar with both Dungeon Crawl Classics and you're considering Lamentations of the Flame Princess, I would say utilize that same line of thinking where the monster is is the monster it is not a monster it is the monster it's not a dragon it is the dragon where your monsters should be terrifying and wondrous and just very unusual and probably scary if you're playing lamentations of the flame princess because this is supposed to be kind of a weird horror sort of role-playing game, even though that vibe does not necessarily come completely across in this rule set, in this kind of core book for the rules and magic. So we get a bit of a glossary. And then we've got firearms. So that is a little unusual for most OSR role-playing games. But as I mentioned before, this is supposed to, the setting is supposed to be kind of a pseudo historical europe so we do have early firearms as well one of the things i think is kind of funny is that we finish off with a character sheet telling us how do you fill out the character sheet and what page do you find this information on but we actually didn't get a character sheet which is fine you can download it i get it but I thought that was kind of unusual because when I first was reading this and I saw the character sheet, I was like, so where's the blank character sheet? <laughs> All right. So as I mentioned, we also get uh, some tables and that, which uh, you would normally find, say, on a Game Master screen. That's what we completed on the, uh, the end pages here. So that is Lamentations of the Flame Princess. This is the Rules and Magic book. Let's swing on over to the other camera because I will provide my final thoughts as well as a review score. Gotta say, I really like Lamentations of the Flame Princess as a, an old-school basic fantasy role-playing game. I think it is really well presented as I have a hair that's been kind of hanging in my eye throughout almost this entire review. It's like, get out of there. Get off of me. Get off of me. I know, old Brady Bunch reference there. Anyway, I really like this book. I think it's really well presented. It's, it makes complete sense. Everything is, is spelled out for you without getting, like, just bogged down in minutia, which we see in a lot of role-playing game core books. So this is succinct, to the point. Everything makes sense. Although I do have to point out, 
I think it's kind of weird that we don't have kind of an action resolution. Now, I'm not saying that we have to come up with like difficult challenges or DCs, whatever you want to say that the DC stands for. I'm not saying we have to have that, but it does make sense that in a case where maybe a feat of strength, you would have to roll under your attribute or some games it's equal to or under your attribute to succeed. I, I would think that's a pretty good home house rule to toss in here. Then again, that might be in the referee book where it talks about resolving actions and things like that, that are not combat, that are not opening a stuck door or climbing a wall or tinkering things like that. As far as the like weird gonzo shock value, you don't see a lot of it in this book. Yes. There are some images that are kind of gruesome. There is a little bit of nudity as well. If that's going to freak you out, get the PDF without art. It's absolutely free. You can't go wrong with that. If Maybe you're concerned with maybe your children seeing some of the artwork in the book, or maybe you yourself feel that some of the artwork could be something that you'll find offensive. I get it. But the, the whole, as I mentioned before, the, the, the kind of line of thinking that I've heard from some people in the past about Lamentations of the Flame Princess, as far as just the, the core book, I'm not talking adventures, I have not read any of the adventures, but I have heard some stories about them. And some of them sound pretty out there. You know, pretty much uh, got to be careful who you're running those adventures for. I've heard that. But as far as the rules and magic book, absolutely not. There's nothing. I didn't find anything shocking for just for the sake of being shocking in this rule book. I really like it. I think a lot of people could do far, far worse looking for a very easy to get into kind of rules, basic OSR role-playing game. You could do far, far worse than Lamentations of the Flame Princess. I give Lamentations of the Flame Princess a very solid 8.5 out of 10. I do ding it a little bit because there's no section about magic items. There's really no bestiary whatsoever, as well as, uh, like, the action resolution isn't real clear. And like I said, I would just be doing house rules. But still, all in all, really do dig it. I think the encumbrance rules are easily adapted to whatever system you possibly are using. And I definitely love the magic section as well. I think there are some really cool spells in there also. All right, that is it for this time out. If you like the video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. It'll not only let you know when I upload videos such as this review, it'll also inform you when my live stream, The Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs right here on YouTube as I bring you the latest in tabletop gaming news as well as first looks at said tabletop games. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Until I see you next time, I am Jeff McAleer, and I certainly hope each and every one of you has an opportunity to do some great gaming with your very own gang. Oh, you're still here. Well, while you're kicking it, how about subscribing to the Gaming Gang channel or seeing the latest episode of the Gaming Gang Dispatch for finding out what... YouTube recommends you check out here at my channel. And of course, don't forget, get your geek on at thegaminggang.com.